format and then I have to upload them. So, all right. Uh, Colin from Figure. Oh, you gave him the homework? Okay. Homework for, for that, that uh, session. Uh, all right. We were doing uh, uh, superposition to find the beam deflection. And we're going to use that again now to determine the reactions for over-constrained beams. Uh, what over-constrained means to us is that those are beams that are statically indeterminate. The type of beams where there's actually more support than is needed for the minimum static equilibrium we have to always have in this class. For example, this type of beam has always been statically determinate. If we knew its length and we knew what this loading happened to be, then we could determine what the reactions at the wall were. It was sufficient to use our static equilibrium equations and we could figure out all reactions. Well, there's only uh, two reactions. There's the reactions at the wall of the shear and the moment. They go with uh, an embedded uh, support like that. However, if we have the situation like this, that beam is over constrained. There's more support than it really needs. Uh, we never took this possibility of this beam actually bending in statics, and we never did until just this last month of the course. But the reality of it, of course, and especially in this course, which is uh, occasionally called um, uh, something like uh, the uh, the strength of deformable solids or something like that, which is what really happens in life. Uh, if we didn't support it here, then this whole beam would sag down. Um, and if that's, if that's not allowable, uh, which it wouldn't be for certain buildings and the like, we've got to support it there in real life. Maybe not even a roller, maybe even a pin support, or maybe not even that. It could be that you want to embed it at both ends. And that's an even more severely over-constrained situation. And beyond the capability of us to find those supports based just on our static equilibrium equations, the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments. But if you're building something, that's probably how you do it. Um, the, 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 the situation is that uh, if we did it for just the cantilever beam and then actually supported it that way, then it's, it's sort of like a safety factor built in. It's now got more support than the minimum we required back in statics, uh, back when you were engineering students only this high last fall. It's a little baby engineering students. However, there are still, even though this has more support than it needs, there's still troubles with this. If this is loaded somehow, um, it's going to deform, and that de deformation, even though it's only a, a minor sag, could cause uh, undue damage or stresses or even separation at those points, even if the beam itself can withstand the bending, it doesn't mean that those supports can. So there's there's troubles with over-constraining that uh, wouldn't necessarily be apparent. So we'll look at uh, a fairly simple technique to determine what the reactions are for this over-constrained load, even though um, our static equilibrium equations won't quite suffice. And we'll use superposition to do it. So we'll take that beam and break it into two cases that we add together because individually we can figure out what's going on with these. 
So we have the first situation that we can handle, and by can handle it, I mean that we can either come up with uh, um, the the reactions, or we can uh, we can use this new beam deflection stuff we're working on to uh, to help us with these, because this kind of loading is in the tables and we know that deflection will do something like that. Uh, the slope will stay zero at the wall because of the embedded nature of the, the support. That, that's why we don't pin those kind of things there because then uh, we, we have under constrained situation. And we know that there'll be some deflection here at the end for that kind of loading. So that's our, our first phase of the superposition uh, solution that we're going to use. And then we're going to add to it another solution that we can do, and that's the case of uh, a single point load out here at the end that will restore the deflection we suffered in the first one. So we have to size up P so it's big enough so that its deflection upward is the same as this deflection downward we suffered in the same one and that will return us then to this situation of an undeflected beam and we'll have then the reaction here which will be P and then once we have that we can uh, use the statics to determine the other reactions at the wall if we needed those. That's in the book, in the table of, of already done solutions, but is this one. So opening up your book, go to Appendix C and double check because uh, it's not that we can't do that. We could do that. We could, we could figure out the moment as a function of X and then integrate back to the deflection. But it'd be nice if it's already done for us. So in Appendix C, notice that There's one page of simply supported and then another page of cantilever beams, right? And is this solution in there? Can we, can we alter where they have the... It's in there if we flip it upside down, which is no big deal. We just have to turn it over, make sure we handle minus signs right, and we're going to be okay. So... Um, We'll, we'll call this one one and this one two. So for the uh, deflection down of one, the maximum deflection, notice one of the columns given there is, is V max, I think. Now that I don't have my book. So Pat, you have to take over. Yeah, there's a V max. What is it? Negative P L cubed. Negative P L cubed over three EI over 3 EI. Remember, EI is, is, a, is the type of thing you get if the beam is already specified. You have some in stock or you have others you uh, know you can purchase or experience has told you that's what you want. Um, whatever the case may be. Now hang on, that's not, that's not for, for this beam, is it? Or Vmax? Yeah, that's for, for the lower one. Fun here, work with me, Pat. I'll have to charge you when I loan you by the books if you're not going to help support me here. So what's what is V max for the uniformly loaded cantilevered beam? Do we, we have, hang on? Uh, <laughs> we trust Pat to do this right this time. All right. Negative W 
L so forth. Uh huh. Over a pi. Okay. So we need that then to be equal to the maximum deflection from uh, for the second model where P is an unknown and we'll be able to set them equal and opposite and then solve for solve for P. So what's the uh, the loading on that one? The, the maximum deflection on that one? Negative P L cubed. That was the P L cubed over what? 3 EI. 3 EI. Now, negative. it's negative but we're flipping it over and need it to go up so we'll make it positive. It's negative in the book. We're flipping it over, so we'll make it positive. And then we want those two, then, uh, of course, to be equal. And then that'll be our method for solving for the reaction P. Now, notice what happened in every single one of the other over-constrained problems we did. Uh, we started with a couple of these type of loadings. Remember, there was some vertical load on here, and it was over-constrained at the ends because our, our original, the, the loading we started the class with was strict axial loading. Then we looked at the strain that caused. Then we looked at uh, some uh, over-constrained uh, torsional loads of some kind when we were looking at uh, our, our first opportunity to look at those things where the ends couldn't move at all, but the, the, the uh, shaft in between was being twisted somehow. For those, as well as for this, notice that it's the same for any beam, any material we choose. The, the, these solutions, uh, in a sense, are universal. Other than, of course, it depends upon the loading and the length of the beam, because that will all cancel out. But the, the EI itself cancels out, which is kind of interesting. And then you get simply 3 eighths WL is the reaction uh, of this over-constrained reaction that we have at that end support. What happened to the negative? Oh, sorry. What I what I what we need to do is we need to add these together to equal zero, and then when we solve for them, then uh, then we don't have the negative, All right? B, I, I missed this step. V1 plus V2 equals zero, or V1 equals minus V2. Because one's down, one's up. So that'll take care of the negative. And uh, what's this term omega, or, or WL? Put that into words, what that is. Well, not just that, but no. What are the units on W? Force. Yeah, it, units might be something like kilonewtons per meter. Units on L might be something like meters. That's the, the WL is this total load. Remember, if we take all of that out and replace it with a single force, it would be equivalent to the area there. So 3 eighths of the total load will be at P. And then we can use the two of those to go back and figure out what the shear is at the wall.
we now know that there's a, a total of uh, omega L there. There's three eighths, not omega W L, and then we can figure out how much shear the wall needs to supply, and then also how much. moment in my supply. We can just finish those with, with straight stat, just summing the forces and summing the moments. In fact, I don't even think I, yeah, I didn't even do it. So, you can do it if you want. Just not now. Well, actually, uh, Sorry? Yeah, V is pretty obvious. Um, the, the moment, you know, you can replace it with that, the, the total load, you know it would be at the center. So uh, you'd have V by then, and well, V is going to be what? 5 eighths WL, right? And then you can figure out the moment of the wall. However, uh, we can use the same general method to also find out the moment of this with another superimposed solution. So we start with this original problem. And turn it into two superimposed solutions that will allow us to find the find the moment. we had this simply supported uniform load, the beam would tend to deflect like that, which is uh, an insufficient picture because we know that the real bending will be such that there's no slope at the wall because of the embedded load there. So we imagine then that what this also needs is, is a moment in that direction that will pull this end up to zero slope. And then those two we can break into two separate solutions we can do and then simply add them together. Which is that solution plus this separate solution that will then give us the uh, moment at the wall. Alright, uh, that's the picture of what we're doing, but then we use this fact that the deflection down has got to equal the deflection up. What kind of uh, boundary condition, if you will, do we need on this one? to uh, be able to put the two solutions together, the two separate solutions together that we can do, 
such that they equal the two, the, the one solution that we couldn't do separately. We need some condition that links these two to be equivalent to these two. Like we had this. We had the, the deflection of the end that we needed to uh, negate. And it has to do with what we can get out of the table for these two things. So look in the table, there's a couple things available. For these two, both these loadings are in the book, right? And then there's, uh, I think, three columns that follow. And the three columns have... Am I remembering right? Three columns? Yeah, three columns that follow. There's the picture in the first column. Then there's a column for the slope, a column for the deflection. That's what we just used on the first method of the problem. And then there's the elastic curve itself. When, like, when the last problem we were doing, like um, yesterday, like when we were integrated a few times and we'd get the deflection, mm -hmm. that wasn't the elastic curve of the deflection that we were getting? No, that was the elastic curve we got from that. And then uh, you find out where that's a maximum and you get that center, uh, okay. center column. Isn't that center column maximum yeah. deflection? Yeah, yeah for. Uh, it might not be Vmax for all of them. It might be the deflection at a certain point. It depends on each one of the loadings. What we need is that the slope at the wall is zero because that's the nature of a of a cantilever beam at the at the wall itself. So what's the angle, the slope for this loading uh, it's symmetric, so it doesn't matter which side, but uh, we're working on the left side. So I think they call that theta 1. Thanks. Uh, yeah. yeah. Negative uh, um, L or 6 EI. Yeah. That M is, at, is the over what? <laughs> Did I switch? What did I switch? No, I didn't switch it. Oh, Pat did? Pat, turn the book over. What is it? Minus W. Okay. Yeah, and then we want to combine you with the one above it, which is in the opposite direction. <laughs> So, this one is, is what? Minus WL cubed. Is that right? Yes. Over, 20, Over 24EI. 24 now, those things are all uh, supposedly set. We want that to equal zero, but what we wanted more to equal is the angle also seen with this at the moment end and realizing that in the picture we have we're, our moments going the other way, isn't it? So this beam would tend to deflect up because of the way it's drawn and so that's the angle that we need to turn around the other way. 
So we got to flip this picture over as well. And make sure you're looking at the angle that's at the moment end. What is it? Should it be, uh, this, this is a positive value, should we say negative? Well, just, just read it right out of the book, okay. which is M naught L over 3 uh, M naught L over 3 DI. Okay, and we need we need that angle to be equal to this angle. Now let's see if we got the directions right. This one's negative, we got a negative. This one's positive, we've got a positive. We want those two to be equal. Actually, what we want is them both to be zero. But if we solve it that way, we get m equals zero, or l equals zero, or e i equals an infinite. So we want we want that solution uh, that solution possibility there. And so you get a slope at the wall. Notice again, EI cancels, one of the L's cancels, and you can get a moment of negative WL squared over Eight. What's the negative mean? Remember, that was one of our senses for negative moment. We call moments that make the beam smile positive. Remember, this this is making the beam frown, so it's negative. How come you don't use the right hand rule for that? Because we have. Um, the possibility of moments at either end that will be in opposite directions of each other, but will do the very same thing to the beam. Uh, because uh, there's there's essentially no difference between that case we have pictured there and the case where we do the same thing on the other end and the reaction of the beam is essentially the same in either one. It's not a symmetric loading, but the angle here will be the same as the uh, angle there, at least in the absolute value. But by right-hand rule, those two moments are, are completely opposite, yet they do the same thing. Did we add theta 1 to theta 2, or did we sum those to 0? I forget what you said. Well, we wanted the angle to actually be zero. Right. We want both of these to be zero, which means they're equal to each other. But if we set it equal to zero and solve for that, we get a moment of zero. Well, that just means the beam's unloaded. So what we really need to do is set they're equal, they're equal to zero, but then solve that part of the equality not the equal to zero part of the equality. Does that make sense? No. No? Uh, we, we, have, we have A equals B equals zero. Yeah. Now there's, there's zero, zero. we don't want to solve B equals zero. That will give us an answer, but it will give us an answer of the moment being zero, and that just means the beam's unloaded. There is no moment. So all we're doing then is solving the unloaded beam, which of course has a slope of zero. So we want to solve this part of the equality where the two are equal to each other. Uh, they just happen to be equal to zero. We don't want to solve uh, this one equal to zero either because 
then again, it's just an unloaded beam and we, we're not really solving any problem. So we're setting them equal to zero. Um, to get to get the, the right moment. Now you might ask the question: Do uh, well? We just did we just did two solutions. Now we did we did this solution of superposition to find the moment. We also did the original solution we looked at. where this business equals, uh, oh wait, no, we had, we had the candle, but that's what we had. Where we had <coughs> this problem plus So we, uh, and this one we'd solve for this, we solved for this reaction and then could use that to go back and find out what the moment was. Or we could solve for the moment directly using this and then go back and figure out what the reaction P was. They should get the same thing. But the question might be, does this solution give the same beam deflection that that solution does. Do these two solutions, the one down here and the one we did first, give the same beam deflection equation? Remember, that's the curve the final loading has itself. And if you take the last column for both of these solutions, the last column being the beam deflection curve for each of the particular loadings, add them together, you do indeed get the same beam deflection equation for both. And it comes out to be wx squared. Remember, it's the deflection is a function of x. over 25 EI times minus x squared minus uh, plus 5 halves LX minus then um, 3 halves L squared. That's from taking the beam deflection of this one, and the, the beam curve of this one, adding it to the beam curve of this one, and comparing it to the beam curve for this one, added to the beam curve for that one, and both give the same result uh, as you can check, and then that's the result there. And that would be then this final beam curve. So we have the reaction, at both ends and the beam curve itself by adding the two solutions together where neither the book didn't have the original over constrained problem. Yep. Are they always going to be equal to both curves? They should be. Yeah. Um, uh, there, I guess they're, well, I don't I, if, if we're using those simple models to put them all together, yeah, it should be. Okay. I don't see why it wouldn't. So if it's wrong, then like, you made a mistake going through it? Yeah. If we do a problem with this on test, do we have to simplify that and factor everything out and whatnot? Or? I would not believe it. it it's, I, I factor out major things like this, but then I wouldn't do anything more with that. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, you mean factor this part? Because it's a uh, no, I was just saying, but, right? I don't know, when I was doing the homework problems, I came to like a, another part before when you add all the constants together and just write the general form, and then I wrote underneath that, like, you know, a simplified version that's like that. Do 
we have to write that version, like that you have on board there, or can we just leave it in the form with like, you know, well, whatever plus C1 and then solve in C1 and C2 or? The, the thing is there's no standard way this has to finish up. Yeah. Somebody else might leave the x squareds in there and it's still correct. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't say you have to factor it to a certain level because everybody's going to see that slightly differently. Um, however, um, I think uh, uh, the over-constrained problems are probably a little much for an exam. So we'll just do a uh, uh, superposition. Well, for the exam, we've got, uh, we'll probably just do a beam deflection problem alone. I, I don't know if I'll do it. Well, it might do a superposition because otherwise then you have to integrate and that can be real time consuming, real fraught with error. But um, we'll probably just do a simple uh, superposition problem. Is that okay? Yeah, I thought it would be simple, but yeah, sounds good. <laughs> well, these, these are fairly simple. I mean, it, you, you have to, uh, this one wasn't a big stretch, was it? But uh, if I leave out over constraint, see the over constraint is it's it's hard sometimes to see just what it is you need to put together yeah. to get the back. But for a simple loaded beam that doesn't happen to be in the table, but is made up of two things that are, that's a lot easier to see. I think. You know the the one we had yesterday. I think we had uh, just a simply supported beam with a uniform load, and then a single load at a single spot, didn't we? Isn't that the one we did yeah. yesterday? Yeah, that's that's just what we did. And that was pretty, it's pretty easy to see what two models, what two cases make up that one. You just add together the formulas in here, whether you're solving for slope yep. direction or elastic curve. Yep. You just add together the I two, the two of those separately. This thing really did that part where we had to split part A and part B and B. Right. And we had to have two different equations. Do we add them together after or do we keep those separate? Or we keep those well, it's, it's tricky to write what the deal is at the board, whereas if you're putting it in a spreadsheet, it's a lot easier to do. The, the trouble was with uh, this part of the solution that, as written in the book, it's a one sided solution. Um, the book lists that distance is A and this distance is B and then the, the, the solution they give in the book is for 0 up to A which means it only works for this side then so that would give you some kind of beam deflection that's accurate for this end it would give you the right slope it would give you the right displacement here. Then you have to turn the solution around and do it from the other side, which now this side would become A, that becomes B, and the solution's good from this side up to the load. And that gives you a different solution, but they would match anyway when you put the two solutions together. It's very easy to do on a spreadsheet because you can have uh, a column for zero to this point and then a column for zero to this point, but then when you graph them, you graph them zero to that end and just put the two uh, calculated reflections together. Um, this is where they intersect them. And then they, they intersect uh, just perfectly right there. The slopes match as they should and the deflections match. Because they're they're done from the same problem. It just flipped around from other different ends. But how do I write that on the board as a single equation? I can't really. Because the well we could it's uh I guess that you'd have to make the variable here not the x that's in the book, you'd have to make that variable L minus x, which gets kind of messy because you have x squared, which now becomes L minus x squared. 
of L times X, but now it becomes L times L minus X. So it gets kind of messy. It's pretty easy to do on a spreadsheet, but it's very difficult to write up to the board as a single equation. Maybe I should give you a take home then, so you could fix you know, babies. All right. So here's here's one for you to take a look at. At least set up the equations, even if the algebra needs to be left over. Set up the situation you need, what things you need to put together to get the proper solution. So Again, a simply supported beam, however, an over-constrained one. So we've got three supports there at two-thirds L and one-third L, and uh, a uniform loading, which could be the uh, weight of the beam itself or it could be maybe something like a snow load. So look at the book, decide what two solutions you want to add together, and what the uh, what the uh, deflection quantity is that you you want to equate. First problem we did the deflection. The second problem we did the angle. So you've got to decide somewhere among those kind of things um, for two models to find the reaction. If we label these points A, B, and C. two cases in the appendix C that will we can put together to make the overconstrained problem and then what uh, what parameters you need to equate between the two and this we're always doing the deflection of the last I don't know you You need to find the reactions. So whatever it takes to do that, um, I guess you could do it with the deflection curves. What two models? Of course, uh, uh, one I think is probably fairly easy. Right, just a straight uniform load, simply supported. That model is in the book. But then what are you going to add to it to get to our original problem? A support of a force here that represents that support. In what direction? That naturally it's going to be up because that's what that reaction is going to do. So that will be the reaction in B. Once you get that, then you can get the other reactions 
using uh, some of the forces and some of the moments. But then what, uh, what parameters do you use to determine what that is? problem is going to deflect something like that. What's wrong between that deflection and the original loading? The fact that we have this intermediate support where there can't be any deflection. So whatever deflection we get here we've got to undo here because this beam is going to deflect something like that. So we need to, to have it such that V1 is the opposite of V2. Jake, I think uh, you can do that by taking the beam curve for this, adding it to the beam curve for this, which will have uh, B as an unknown, and then um, setting that beam curve equal to zero at a place at two, X equals two-thirds L. I would think that would work. I think it would be a little more difficult, probably, but I... I have the sense that you'd like to take that challenge on for the benefit of the class. Is that what everybody else is feeling? I think so. They're all smiling, Jake. I think probably the deflection is the easier way to do it because there's there's not much to that, is there? Uh, yeah, well, for the off-center load, it's a little bit, but not terrible. And for the uniform load, Vmax, well, we don't want Vmax. You're actually going to have to use the beam curve because Vmax, remember, is at the center where this deflection is not. So you're going to have to do uh, V1 evaluated that x equals uh, two-thirds L. And V2 is evaluated at x equals A equals two-thirds L. But once you get all those pieces together, a whole bunch of stuff cancels. deflect positively, this beam, when loaded, will probably do something like that. 
where there's actually going to be some upward deflection of the of the beam at that far end. So, well, Jake, Jake will let us know if that's just what happens when he adds those beam curves together. Can I do that? Like, from, for, um, for number two, you know, how you have to do from... Um, up, just up to the yeah, level? Yeah, and then yep. you, have to do, you have to do the other one. You, you just add those together to get the total, or...? Well, uh, you, you add them together by doing it from one end, and then doing it from the other end. Right. But when you do that, they don't share the same x. Here, x goes this way up to here, a distance of 2 thirds L. And when you do it on the other side, x goes from here to here, a distance of 1 third L. How do I combine those three? That's why I said it's easy to do it on the spreadsheet. And on the spreadsheet, you have this, this uh, uh, you have two curves, and this goes from 0 to 2 thirds L that way and uh, calculate that down to there. And then you can do a second column. So I guess I call this 1 and 2. This one you do from 0 up to one third L that way, and then calculate the deflection that goes with that, and then they should meet right there. The slope should be the same, and the deflection should be the same. Because then you can take a third column, which is just zero down to L just for graphing purposes. You don't actually calculate anything with it. And then plot these deflections. That's how I did the, that plot I showed you yesterday. Try it as part of your upcoming presentation for the class. Yeah. Right? Brandon's all excited about that. Yeah. He doesn't poke his eye out. I'm excited. I'm always excited. I can tell. I live very excited. You do. Um, sounds like you need an extra credit problem. That would usually motivate you, Jake. If you, if you come up with this beam curve uh, plot of it, I'll take that for some extra credit. Anyway, since we're at the end, if you... Uh, do this, you should get that B equals something like 0 0.688 um, WL, the total of 60, just under 69% of the whole load, which is kind of interesting because it's at, it's at two thirds the distance, but it's got a little over two thirds the load on it. Which is, is kind of interesting. Um, I think it's because uh, a longer stretch has more flex to it than does a shorter stretch. So the shorter stretch is transmitting more of the force. Anyway, double check, see if you get that. Then we'll see uh, what uh, what Jake does with the load curve. Jake, you're not in the load? I, I, I just don't know. I don't know how to go. Well, think about it. Sit, sit with the spreadsheet and try it and then it becomes a little more odd.